we are going to get right into the topic which is called dating tonight. Um, so we're going to discuss around that. I don't know how long this topic will take, but it's something I can cover very quickly. But let's see what, what we can get into and what the Holy Spirit shares tonight. Interesting thing is about dating. The first thing that I'm, I need to maybe point out there, it's, it's related to culture. All right. I've found that over the years, counseling, uh, young adults, counseling young uh, teenagers about dating and getting into a relationship with, uh, between a man and a woman. Um, we found that different cultures have got different attitudes, different approaches, different ideas of what dating is. And that creates a dilemma because We've got to be careful that when you come with a Western culture, that uh, you also realize and understand that we are on the Af African continent and there are many other cultural groupings on this particular continent that we need to keep in mind and, and deal with. Then, of course, you've got all the, the Eastern religions and you've got all the other people as well. And every single person has got, or every single culture rather, has mostly got different approaches on dating. So a lot of the things that we're going to say tonight is most probably going to relate more to the Western culture, and uh, but I'll try and point out some of the variances and the differences that, that apply to the various groupings. So having said that then, I think initially we need to just try and understand what dating means, okay, for those people that might not understand it. That is basically when a young couple, a girl and a boy, go out and, and normally get acquainted and get better known with each other. And that relationship is what normally the, the, the natural progression from there is to come into a commitment one to another and to be able to then live out your life together. The problem is in today's world that many people are getting into relationships, dating so to speak, but never come to a place of either committing one to another but they rather just spend time together. And it's, it's convenient from many, very, many points of view. In other words, from a, a financial point of view, from a commitment point of view, from a responsibility point of view, from all those views, they think it's easier because you can just opt in, opt out, so to speak, out of these relationships and there's no uh, permanence in the relationships. That brings a lot of shipwreck into the relationships with people. Obviously, we as believers want to see a commitment between a man and a wife. We want to see them ultimately enter into marriage. And out of that comes children and comes a long life together, etc. And the Bible talks about many benefits once you come together and you actually commit to a long-term relationship and enter into marriage. Because what that refers to is a, a covenant one with another. Uh, and also taking vows where you commit yourself one to another. Now, when you go into dating and you take dating very lightly and all the, um, also, well, let me rephrase it, some of the physical benefits are brought into the dating relationship, um, the long-term commitment one to another is then not necessarily entered into. Vows are not made and vows in God's sight is an important thing. Um, God hates divorce and therefore when a man and a woman commit one to another, there's a vow involved in that we will commit and we will stay together uh, until death do us part. So we have to therefore understand that dating in today's world is meaning a lot more than just, hey, let's get together, get to know one another. Now, also what we've got to keep in mind is that if you look at culture during the biblical days when the Bible was authored and written, the customs at those times were that people or youngsters would get married at the age of 13 and 14, and, and that's at a very, very young age. Today, you don't see that. Today, it's 20 plus, okay, that you've got to be of age before there's even any kind of commitment made one to another or even pursued because you've got to go through schooling, education, very often there's, there's uh, post uh, studies that need to happen. Uh, there's money to be made to be able to set up a home, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens before couples commit one to another to be able to enter into marriage. So today's world and the way we, we conduct ourselves today has changed most probably quite dramatically from Bible days. But even if you look at some of the other cultures, um, there was, there's even to today still a lot of um, organized, in inverted commas, uh, marriages, all right? And people come together and their marriage is, 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 is orchestrated 
and, um, and organized. Although in today's world, if you look at especially the Western culture, that is no longer applicable um, and very, it's very rare. You won't find that happening. But nevertheless, we have to look at those particular things. Now, obviously, some of the issues that we have with dating as pastoral um, staff or leadership of the church is specifically that normally in the dating environment, a dating should be an opportunity in a Western culture or any culture for that matter, um, where two people get to know each other better. And that is developing a friendship. Okay, coming to a place where you know one another, you get to understand one another, you, you talk, you discuss, you check out values, all that kind of stuff. But the problem in today's world is no, no parents prepare their children for marriage. Okay, I find very few couples, very few parental couples, Talk to their teenage children and say to them, listen, you know, when you start looking for a life mate, um, this is the approach you should have. Um, this is what you should be discussing. Here are some pointers for you. These are some important things. And start educating and, and giving that knowledge to your children to understand and know what to look for in somebody else, what to discuss when you actually meet up with one another. Obviously, it doesn't have to be an interview. We're not talking about that. But the thing is, what we are talking about is understanding that there's a compatibility going on here and getting to know one another and see if there's an opportunity for the two to, to maybe fall in love. So you've got this situation then that there's very, very little preparation that comes into play. So now what happens is hormones come into play, all right, because... If a child was married at 13 or 14 years old, puberty has not really even been entered into, so the, the sexual drive is therefore not even a consideration. The problem today, again, in the Western world is that by the time that they start dating, the, the sexual attraction is already there, and therefore it is quite easy to enter into a physical relationship much earlier than what you should, and that physical relationship is where the problem really comes in. And that is where we have an issue. Because if you look at dating then, there's now no boundaries. There's no boundaries set between two people. Like in my particular case, I got born again when I was still a teenager. And when I was, I made a decision because I was taught this by our pastors. And I made a decision the minute I got born again that I want to have I will not have another woman until such time as I'm married. And so therefore, I want my wife to keep herself pure. I want it to be pure. And therefore, I made that decision. And that's how we I prepared myself for marriage. But today, many people don't do that. I know of certain cultures where even when there is dating happening, um, their understanding is that the dating is actually like a physical commitment one to another already. It does not mean it's a permanent commitment, but it means that there's the man and the woman will go out and there was an expectation from the man that if he does certain things, pays for certain things, therefore he is entitled. And this whole entitlement thing then comes in. And, and whether there's consensus or not, um, or people agree and, uh, you know, consent or not consensus, but if there is consent between the two, um, that's not even considered, all right? Uh, it's an expectation. Yeah, I did this, I did that, I did, therefore you now owe me. And uh, therefore they feel entitled. Some of the cultures even take dating that far. So, so from a biblical perspective then, it's important that we, when we spend time with the young adults, we spend time with the teenagers, that we explain the biblical standing and the biblical grounding for what God expects and what God wants in a, in a godly relationship. And that is how we prepare our young people for their married life. So that was a long introduction, but I needed to just set the, the foundation for you because the, the, the chances of a couple keeping themselves pure into a relationship Today has become less and less and less and less. And then you, you know, you deal with all kinds of other issues in between as well, which is, is crazy stuff, but we're not going to go into that tonight. I feel that might be for uh, another time. So, so basically then we need to consider, if you consider young people and we look at um, teenagers and, uh, and the young adults, we need to understand that there's a couple of things that they need to, need to obviously Keep in mind, the first thing is that 
men are attracted or turned on sexually by what they see. They, they, uh, they basically look at the looks of a girl and therefore the, the, if she dresses in a prov provocative way or if she prevents herself, uh, presents herself in a special way, that can make the man attracted to her. In the case of a woman, it's just the opposite way around. A woman is more interested in touch, okay, caring, um, nurturing, that kind of thing. That will make her um, attracted to the man. So those are natural facts that we've got to keep in mind. That's the way that the natural body has been, been designed and developed. Now, it's to be able to work within that framework, so to speak. All right. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. And it says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with proprietary and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Well, now, now, what that basically is saying, all right, is dress appropriately, all right? It's not saying um, dress ultra conservative and you cannot wear jewelry and you cannot, you know, braid your hair and you cannot do all this stuff. It's not saying that. What it is saying is when you dress yourself and present yourself in a way that's provocative, um, women know exactly how to do that. And they know when they can wear certain, you know, reveal certain amount of flesh, um, the tightness of the clothing, uh, the placement of certain jewelry and stuff like that. All those things will be attractive to men. So therefore, the Bible encourages a woman to say to her, listen, be careful how you dress, all right? Consider your dress code because that can become a stumbling block unto a man, for argument's sake. But we do understand also that a woman wants to look attractive, all right? And we're not talking about, there's a difference between being attractive and being lustful or sexually um, explicit, all right? Let me put it that way. There's a difference between the two. So that is what, that's what needs to be considered when, um, Two people are wanting, to, or when a woman dresses and she's a born again believer, all right, and she's somebody that wants to honor and please God. Then we want to look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. And uh, it says here, it says, Marriage is honorable among all, and that the bed undefiled, but the fornication and adulterous God will judge, all right. Now, what we want to know, bring to your attention in this particular verse is the fact that God is not for adulterers and he's not for fornicators. Now, that is basically in plain English means people that are married cannot go around and, and, and have sex and sleep with other people from, uh, in marriage because that undefiles the bed. And you cannot have sex before marriage because that is fornicating, etc., etc. So therefore, you've got to keep yourself pure. God has made the sexual physical relationship for marriage that is what the bible teaches us and that's what it tells us it's for a married couple to enjoy between them between them okay so we need to keep that in mind and god will judge it god will judge those that that uh, um, practice um, physical relationships outside of marriage and also um, before marriage then in deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 28 through 30 it says, if a man finds a young woman who is a virgin, who is not betrothed, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are found out, then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be with his wife because he has humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife nor uncover his father's bed. Now, I want to highlight in here that sex is a, when two people come together, there's a covenant that is formed between the two. When we enter into a sexual relationship, God sees it as a covenant between the man and the wife. They become one, the Bible says. So therefore, because they become one and because of the sexual relationship between the two of them, there's a covenant that's entered into. Now, that is also a, a problem and an issue before marriage if two people are sleeping around and they have had a whole bunch of partners before they one day decide to settle down and to to get married they have effectively established and broken established and broken established and broken covenant all the time between a man and a wife 
And those things have got a spiritual, um, it leaves a spiritual, um, um, what's the best word to describe this? Uh, it, it brings a spiritual scar, if I can put it that way, um, into the relationship. It's something that the person then needs to be re, um, healed from because it takes away from you. It, it, it takes a part of you when you do that. So there's a little part of you that dies. That's another word in inverted commas. Um, that every time you do that. So therefore, you become, your, your conscience is even seared. Your, your feelings are even limited. So there's so many things that happen when you enter into a physical relationship with multiple partners that causes you to not be able to fully enjoy that which God has prepared for you. All right. So you need to understand that God sees it as a covenant and in God's eyes, it's an important thing. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 13 through 15, it carries on to say, If any man takes a wife and goes into her and detests her and changes her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says, I took this woman when I came to her, I found she was not a virgin. Then the father and mother of the one woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city of the gate. Now what that is talking about, it's talking about the fact that when the, when a girl or a woman is a virgin and there's and she enters into a sexual relationship with a man. The hymn is broken and she and there's, uh, there's blood. The blood talks about establishment of covenant again. We understand that if you look at the covenant setups in the Old Testament, when the every covenant was, was, was made, there was always bloodshed. There was always the blood of either an animal or, you know, different things, mostly animals that were sacrificed. And because of that, there was a, a covenant established then because of the bloodshed. The same thing here between a man and a woman. So that when the man enters a woman, there's blood that's shed. And because of that, there's a covenant that's established between the two of them. And that covenant cannot and should not be broken. All right. So therefore, it is serious when um, a couple is ready to prepare for marriage. The problem in today's world as well is that dating has been taken so glibly that it's, it's, it's fine. You know, it's, we do whatever. Now, if it's just going out and enjoying each other's company and, you know, having fun, whatever, that's fine. That's, there's no issue or problem with that. But when it goes further, then there has to be boundaries that are established. Now, to me, that is the biggest and the, and the, the, the biggest problem with young people today. They have not considered what's important to them. They have not considered what the boundaries are that should be, be had. Now, yeah, again, I feel it's the parents' responsibility that when they teach their children and they speak to their children is to help them establish some of these boundaries, okay? And to tell them what is important and so on. Not to try and leave it to an educational institution, all right, a school or a college or any other institution for that matter, to come and teach your children. That's not, in, not what you want. You as the parent need to take responsibility for your children and you need to teach them these boundaries. Now, these boundaries, again, I'm going to come back to the cultural thing. These boundaries could be different in different cultures. And the reason I'm saying that is because how far is too far, all right, in your relationship? Because obviously, we as, as believers, as men and women of God, we are trying to avoid covenants being established between two people. We are avoiding premarital sex. We are avoiding premarital pregnancies. We are trying to avoid all those things. That is, that is what the Bible teaches and that's what we are trying to promote. Okay. So now we've got to basically set standards. Again, in, 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 in the youngster's life, in the young person's life, um, they need to decide how far they can go. Now we, as from a Western culture and from a, a pastoral point of view, we feel that holding hands and kissing is the, is the ultimate boundary. You don't go past that, all right? So when you go past that, you're going into no man's land and you're going to may, most probably battle to come back, all right, and to battle to retrieve or retreat rather. So let's use that word. So, so, the, you as a, so when we teach young couples, we tell them, listen, holding hands, kissing, that is fine. But there might be instances where even that might be going too far, all right? I know of, of certain cultures as well, when they start dating, they already 
have committed one to another. In other words, there's already been a, a courtship in inverted commas where there's been absolutely no dating, but they have sort of like spoken to one another, got to know one another, seen if there's the opportunity to, to develop something. And then they go into, a, then they, that's sort of like a preliminary courtship situation. And then from there, they will then go into dating. When they get into dating, they are already engaged, all right? They are already committed one to another. They are already um, preparing. They've already set marriage dates. They've already going into premarital counsel, um, et cetera, et cetera. So their dating then is at that, at that level. Then you've got other cultural groups where they basically say to you, okay, fine, the dating in our particular case, we will not allow a, a young couple to, to be on their own, private. So therefore, they only talk about groups. So therefore, if you want to go out somewhere and do something as a couple, there will always be more than one, more than two. So there will maybe be another couple with you or there could be a group, bigger group or whatever the case may be. So they always promote groups, all right? So you might say that's all strict and whatever that case may be. Yes, in, in, in the Western culture, that might be true. But in other cultures, that is the way they prefer to do it. That is the way they protect the youngsters. That's the way they keep them uh, pure before marriage. So therefore, culture does make a big, big difference in the way that dating takes place, the way dating is done, um, what the boundaries are within the dating relationship, how far can you go, what can you do, what can't you do. So there's many things that can, uh, sorry, there's many things to consider in that particular environment. So what we've always advised uh, people, especially in multicultural churches and uh, situations where there's a lot of um, people from different countries, even nationalities, cultures, etc., etc., is to keep that in mind. All right. And then it goes even more interesting. And I, I think, you know, we, we, we don't really want to go there tonight, but it gets even more interesting when you consider things like cross-cultural relationships, okay, where people out of different cultural groupings come together, all right, so, so that makes it even more interesting, all right, because now you've got to consider that one has got one understanding of dating and the other one's got a different understanding of dating, now somehow you've got to reconcile those two, and I think that's again where parents come into the picture, parents need to be, need to understand where, what they would like to see and what the basis is of, of what they believe. Now, obviously, you can only help the youngsters. You can only, you know, counsel them, encourage them, be there for them, and, and so on and so forth. And they have to set their values. They have to make a decision as to where this is going to go. Because very often, as we said earlier on, in today's world, you know, you start dating maybe um, really seriously for marriage, after the age of 20, up to the age of 20, it's, it's, it's really just maybe going out places, doing stuff. Um, and therefore, you're already dealing with adults, okay? Um, they don't need parental uh, super, um, approval for what they do. And therefore, they are adults. So you've got to allow them that. So, so it's a very, it can be a very sensitive um, subject. It can be, a, a, to a, in a point, even a difficult subject. But it is something that has to be spoken about. It's something that has to be discussed. And it's something that has to be, uh, boundaries have to be developed. So that is basically what I wanted to say tonight. So in summary, let me wrap it up. Purity before marriage leads to faithfulness after marriage. All right. And that, that makes it exciting. So, um, you know, you've got, you and I as believers strives towards purity. And that is what we encourage and tell the youngsters to do. Okay, so so yes, dating, my experience over the years has been that in a certain church, we were, we were the designated uh, um, pastoral couple to look after the young adults. And uh, we had to deal with a lot of these things. And um, we found we had a multicultural church at that particular time. And um, yeah, it was a very interesting topic because of the all the different attitudes and cultural understanding of what dating means and uh, what dating is. And we, in the Western culture, um, looked at it a certain way and we found that many of the other cultures, African cultures, um, Eastern cultures, etc., looked at it with a totally different, different way. 
Um, it was impacted by many different things. And we had to obviously bring a, a biblical culture into the thing because obviously that culture that was there already was possibly wrong. And so we had to bring a biblical culture in first. And especially the one issue about uh, the respect between a man and a woman and the way men see women, etc., etc., that also became a major problem in dealing with dating and especially between certain cultural groups. So, so yeah, you've got to keep all these things in mind. That is the wisdom I would, I would say you've got to, you've got to look at. But you first have to understand um, the basics. The basics are that the Bible does not promote sex before marriage. Fornication, adultery is a no-no in Scripture. All right, and because of that, we want the children and the young people to be aware of that. And that when they get into a physical relationship, especially when they come into a place of puberty where they become sexually aroused and stuff like that, that you've got to basically let them set boundaries. And the boundaries will manage their, hopefully manage their hormones, but they'll try. And, uh, and then basically how far do you go, you know. And it takes discipline, you know, because even something like kissing can, can get out of hand. And so you've got to be careful. So even though we say kissing you know, is, is allowed, um, kissing can also get you into trouble, all right? So you can basically overstep the boundary. It's then the young people then have to have the, the, the moral conscience and the discipline to say, so far and no further. We're going to back off at this particular moment in time. And normally when the two discuss that, um, it makes it easier for them to deal with it because the one will keep the other one accountable, especially if they're both born again. But if they're not both born again, you've got an unsaved one and the saved one. That also lends to all kinds of trouble again in the dating environment. So there's so many things to consider when you start talking about dating and, and what, what else. So my encouragement to you is if you are a parent out there, discuss with your child, come into agreement with some boundaries and trust God and believe God that they will honor those boundaries. Um, and then at the same time, you know, let them understand the consequences of what the Bible says and instructs us to do. And let them understand those scriptures. So I hope you learned something tonight. I hope you're encouraged. And I hope you, you can take this and uh, implement it into your families and take it further. So let's just pray together. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity tonight to be able to study your word and find out what your word says about dating, Father. I pray that, Lord, people have received this in the way that... Um, it's been communicated, Father God, and I pray, Lord, that it's fallen on fertile ground that will bear forth much seed and fruit, Father God, and bring deliverance into the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Have an awesome rest of the evening.